It's time we started talking about subclasses. Welcome to the Attic Dungeon. My name is Sam, and whether you want to create or charm, I'm here to help you with everything. So, a while ago, I finished my collection of class guides. You know, the videos where I talked about each class's base features and a bit about the spells in pretty great detail. And I always said I'm not talking about subclasses, I'm going to do that later on. Well, later is now, the future is here. We are going to tackle all of the subclasses in Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. Um, right now, with Fitzban being the last big book that was released, um, there are at least 108 subclasses uh, that I have counted. I'm going to talk about all of them. I'm going to be working on this for quite a while. I expect to be finished by 2050 when 7th edition comes out. Um, how am I going to tackle this? I'm going to start with the same class that I always start with, except when I forget that it's my starting class. I'm going to start with the Bard. Now, in no way I can guarantee that I'm going to do all of the Bard videos and then all of the, I don't know, Ranger videos, <laughs> as if I always try to stall Ranger until the very end. Um, but at least today I'm going to start with Bard subclasses. I'll be talking about three of them, and very simply, they are the three subclasses that appear first when you look at the subclasses in alphabetical order. So I don't start with the player handbook stuff necessarily, I'm just going to do it in alphabetical order. I don't want to do too much effort in ordering subclasses. What am I going to talk about? Obviously, all of the features that you gain from your subclass for some classes, that means extra spells, then I will, of course, look at the spell list as well. Um, and then at the end of each analysis, I'm going to kind of guess the power level. I'm not going to do this Vegeta style. I don't have a little over 9000 scouter, but I have been playing the game long enough to know when a feature is good or when a feature is absolute rubbish. So uh, maybe once I've advanced a bit into the thing, I might do some subclass tier list, but right now that is not going to happen. I'm just going to talk about stuff. As I said, I'm starting with the Bard, with the first three alphabetical subclasses. Those are going to be the College of Creation, the College of Eloquence, and the College of Glamour. Oh dearie me, I almost forgot my promotional talk. Thank you for watching my stuff. I have all the fun while making these. It's still a very good energy outlet for myself and I hope you enjoy watching these. I hope you actually um, have a use for these videos now and then. If you do or even if you don't, I might still be able to persuade you, uh -huh, Bart shenanigans, uh, to press the subscribe button, click the bell, leave a comment, spread the good word about the Attic Dungeon. You'd be a tremendous darling for doing so. And now, on to the Bard subclasses. As I said, alphabetical order, we're tackling three today. We start with the College of Creation. The lore behind the College of Creation is pretty simple. Um, some more religious ideas are that before the first beings were there in the uh, were uh, present in the universe, there was a song. Or in some versions you have that the first beings, or some of the oldest beings, actually sang the song of creation, thus creating more. Uh, I know the Dragonborn lore, Dragonborn lore rather, um, refers to Bahamut and Tiamat being amongst the very first singers of the song of creation. So these bards actually want to tap in some primal power that songs have to create stuff. That is the best explanation I can give for this subclass. Um, now what do they get? Oh yes, first off, obviously, bards always gain subclass features add three fixed levels, being level three, level six, 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 this is six, and level 14, yes, I'm doing this right. Um, usually at level three, they gain two features, one general feature and one related to your bardic inspiration, and then some cool stuff on six and 14. So, College of Creation, at level three, gains, hope, no surprise, two features. The first of uh, the first one is Mode of Potential, and it is linked to your Bardic Inspiration. Again, no surprise there. It actually has three uses, which is pretty cool. It's a pretty flexible ability that costs you no extra resources. Um, let's first talk about what it does. So when you inspire someone, they have this tiny music note, or rather visual aspect of song uh, floating around them. It's 
you can't touch it, you can't do anything with it. It's just there to indicate that you've inspired them and you're a part of the College of Creation. Um, when they use their Bardic Inspiration, depending on what they use it for, something extra will happen. If they use it for an ability check, let's say your feeble wizard needs a boost on it, on its athletic skill and decides to use the uh, Bardic Inspiration for that. Obviously they get to roll it, but they also get to roll their d20 twice and pick whatever they want. So it's strictly it's not giving advantage because for some reason you could also pick the worser option, but it's basically advantage on ability checks, which is really good actually. I think, I think this is actually the strongest option um, of the three in pure numerical benefits and in scaling. Advantage is always great, whether it's level 1 or level 20, advantage is always good. Um, if the target uses its bardic inspiration to buff an attack roll, um, the target and everything around it that you choose so you can keep uh, allies safe have to make a constant Constitution saving throw, rather, and if they fail, they take thunder damage equal to the die roll of the Bardic Inspiration die, which of course gets added to the attack roll still, but it also deals Kaboomy damage. This is pretty okay. I mean, at level 3, you're bursting for 6 damage on 1, 2, maybe 3 targets if the stars really align well. Um, it scales somewhat, of course, your Bardic Inspiration becomes a D8, D10, D12, all the way at level 15. It's never going to be a main source of damage, but being able to whip out, on average, 7, 8 Thunder damage at high levels. I mean, it's not bad, it doesn't scale really well, but it's free damage, it doesn't cost you any extra resources, and you're still buffing the attack roll. Um, and of course, if they are doing a saving throw, they get temporary hit points equal to the Bardic Inspiration die plus your Charisma modifier. This isn't bad. Um, temporary hit point features have a reputation of not scaling too well. This is okay since it scales with your Bardic Inspiration die and it scales with your Charisma modifier to things that are going to grow as you um, invest in your Bardic levels. I hope you're spending points on Charisma at least. Um, so this is okay, and actually the cool benefit of this is that when they pass the saving throw, you know a lot of spells that deal damage still deal half damage on uh, when you make the save. Here you actually mitigate some of that damage immediately because you give them temporary hit points. So even when a spell deals damage or an effect deals damage on a save, you're already preventing that damage. You are 100% sure these temporary hit points are not being wasted and you can just hand out another Bardic Inspiration die when needed. So it's okay. I mean, it's, it's, it's good. It's not bad. Um, and it scales, I think it scales better than the Thunder damage, obviously, because it also gets a Charisma bonus. If the Thunder damage got Charisma bonus as well, that would be pretty rad, but that's not happening. So this is your level three Bardic Inspiration feature mode of potential. Um, I think it's pretty good. It's flexible, so the, the individual aspects are not super powerful, but it's very flexible. You can use it in three different cases. Mind you, nowadays bards can also boost damage caused by spells, and none of these apply to that. So the changes that we got in Tasha's to the Bardic Inspiration die are not included in the College of Creation. There hasn't been any errata for that. But other than that, on attacks, on ability checks and on saving throws, you give a nice little boost and it doesn't cost you any other extra resource. A lot of Bardic Inspiration features from other subclasses require you to spend the Bardic to do something instead of buffing people. So there you have to make a choice. Here you're helping people and helping them even more. This is a pretty good supporting feature. Um, the other one that you get is performance of creation. Simply put, you are allowed with an action, I think, yes, to create a non-magical item within 10 feet of you. It has to appear on the surface. You can't have it float in the air or whatever. It has to appear somewhere in liquid or on a surface that it can support. Um, the size has to be medium, I think. Uh, so medium or small. Yeah, medium or small is allowed here. Tiny would work, I guess. At Oh no, tiny only works later on, I think. So medium or small is what they say, so that's doable. Uh, the value of the item can be a maximum of 20 gold 
per bard level. So even at level 3 that's already objects of um, 60 gold which is pretty good. The item lasts for a number of hours equal to your proficiency bonus. So again at level 3 it's 2 hours and it will grow. You can do this once per long rest or you can do it multiple times but then you have to spend a second level spell slot for the second and third time that you want to use this feature. Now you might be wondering, oh, non magical items, what can I create with that? Actually, the sky is pretty much the limit here because there is no further limitations other than gold cost and size. Um, if you need to get into some place and you've had a half decent look at the key of a door, you could create this key for two hours. You just go, shalala, here's my key. And then you get in the place and you can act as if you've already always had a key. Mind you, the item does make musical notes when you hold it close to you, so they'll know something's up with this. But still, this is a, a great alternative lockpick. This is also really good when you're stuck in a hard spot. Um, the party has been captured. You've been robbed of your equipment. Oh, it gads. Half your spells can't be cast now because you don't have your uh, channel-y thing, your loot or whatever you use to cast your spells. This actually allows you to create, uh, I forgot the, the, like the name of the, your spell focus, there we are. This allows you to create a spell focus for one of your spellcasters. Those are non-magical items. Like a component pouch might be a bit off because that those are different items in a bag, technically speaking. Um, but a, a focus like a crystal orb or a loot for you or a flute, whatever. You can create that for two hours to facilitate your escape. Um, your your spell foci are not magical period so this is actually really good in jailbreak scenarios uh, because you don't need your spell casting item to use performance of creation you can just shalala it into existence that's how strong the song of creation is you can just sing things into existence the only real boundaries on this thing are players creativity size at the start and how flexible your dungeon master is because i think a good question is could you copy a letter with writing and everything i mean sure you could create a piece of paper but could you copy an entire letter with the writing i think i would say yes because it is one object the ink is incorporated into the paper bit but i could imagine some dungeon masters being uh, less flexible on that um, the other limit size kind of goes away because at level 6 you can create large items and at level 14 you can create huge items and the cost of course scales as well so at level 20 you can create a huge item that is worth 400 gold that offers you a lot of creativity for your second level spell slots or your one a day feature so the fun feature in combat not that useful probably but it certainly has its uses um level six then you gain animating performance uh, again once per day or by using a third level slot you can animate an item basically you create the pets if i want to downplay this a bit it's a summoning class for the for the bard i suppose you can animate maybe a sword that's lying about or even honestly a chair or a boot would do on anything works you can a uh, large or smaller non-magical item and the size is not going to influence the stats of the thing so maybe a bit unlogical uh, here but it deals the same amount of damage whether you animate a spoon or you animate a uh, sword same damage is the damage good it's pretty decent there's a stat block in the ability explanation basically first off the item can't be morphed you can't change it in something more deadly um it uses your spell attack modifier to hit it hits for d10 plus your proficiency bonus you can uh, it will always dodge you can move it around on its turn it will always dodge automatically unless you use a bonus action to command it to attack um, as with a lot of summons it takes its turn right after you um, the good news is because you might think oh but i need my bonus action for bardic inspiration stuff Got you covered, this feature explicitly states that you can command the item and still hand out a Bardic Inspiration in the same um, bonus action. So that actually makes it very valuable. Um, and it also automatically reduces the speed of creatures within 10 feet 
by 10 feet and it's creatures of choice so you can exclude allies include enemies there you are uh, it has dark vision which is fun i didn't know the thing I had to see i would expect it to have blind side now i'm imagining a floating spoon of death with googly eyes on it um it has quite a few immunities like i think poison and psychic damage don't work on it because you, it doesn't have a brain and it can't be poisoned but it's also immune i i tell you it was also immune to like being charmed and stuff like that so pretty logical immunities uh 16 armor class and the hit points is 10 plus five times your bard level yeah plus five times your bard level so it's a fairly decent summon that sticks around for uh i forgot actually i think it's an hour uh, it sticks around for a while. It's either an hour or something based on proficiency or charisma. You know the drill. Um, you can only have one at a time though. It scales decently because the hit points will scale, the damage will scale. It's a nice little summon to have. It doesn't use concentration. So if you think, oh, it's a bit disappointing because um, the scaling isn't as rough as I would love it. It doesn't use concentration, so you can combine this with other summony spells. I think the uh, animate object is that the one where you actually spawn a bunch of objects, well, animate a bunch of objects, and there it does matter whether you animate one large one or a bunch of small ones. Here it doesn't, but then you have animate objects, <laughs> 10 spoons flying about, and you create your 11th Omni Spoon with your class feature, and you have an army of killer spoons just waiting for your command. I'm just going out on the limp here. I, I, it's, a, it's a decent feature. It's a nice summon to have. Uh, and then at level 14, you get Creative Crescendo. Your performance of creation thing. So your level 3, the second level 3 feature, can create more items than one at a time. It can create a number of items equal to your Charisma modifier, at least two. Now, I'm hoping by level 14, your Charisma modifier is higher than 14 as a Bart. Otherwise, I wonder what spells you've been using. Um... One can be the maximum size, which is huge at this point, and the rest has to be small or tiny. So, I don't know, one giant block of granite and four keys are a perfect possibility. And there is no gold limit anymore. So what I said earlier about the 400 gold block, you can already forget about it because there's no gold value limit here, which is just opening the bounds of creativity even more. Uh, that's it for the College of Creation. Now, power level wise, um, you might see that there's not a lot of combat shenanigans here. Sure, you have the very nice Bardic Inspiration buff and you have your summon, but that's it. The other feature, so you're basically your uh, performance of creation, is heavily aimed at being a creative out of combat player. Um, which is good. I mean, it's, it's nice, it's a good subclass. It's not the strongest subclass, but it will certainly pull its weight in the hands of the right player. I think this is a subclass that you should not take in your first game of Dungeons & Dragons because the creativity aspect requires you to have, well, maybe not like D&D experience, but role-playing experience. You need to know what you can do within the settings of the game with an option that gives you a free creation button, basically. So it's a... Uh, it's more than decent, I think. The Bardic buff is nice. I like the summon. The creativity will define whether it's more than decent or really great within your campaign, depending on the player. But it is certainly not a bad subclass. So, then let's move on to the subclass that I share a hardened love-hate relationship with, the College of Eloquence. But Sam, the College of Eloquence is like one of the most bardy classes out there. How can you hate it? It's very simple. Chatty McChatterbox here has one feature that I think is too strong and ruins part of the game. I am, of course, talking about Silver Tongue. Silver Tongue on paper looks nice. It's, <laughs> it's more than nice, obviously. Um, it says that for any persuasion or deception check, anything that you roll that is lower than a 9 is treated as a 10. So you can only roll 10 and up with this skill. Sounds nice, um, but then you have to think further. Okay, so I will always have at least 10 on a persuasion check or a deception. You're going to have proficiency in one of those two at least. So proficiency plus two, you'll have 12 always. Uh, you're a bard. 
Nowadays, especially with Tasha's, chances are about 90% that you will have 16 Charisma at level 1. So, plus 2, 3 even. So, without rolling, you have 15 on a Persuasion check. If you look at the table of um, DCs for skill checks, 15 is like the nice amount. Like, 5 is easy, 10 is, sure, you know, you need some roll, it's not hard. 15 is, you, you would need some proficiency to have a decent chance at succeeding at this, and 20 is, this is hard. Here you are succeeding at everything up to medium to high medium checks without rolling. You're just, I have 15, give me the information. Um, at level 4, you could obviously pump two more points in charisma, which would make your persuasion slash deception even better. You will always have... Um, 16 and you should not forget that at level 3 as well I think it is you gain expertise you can pump up one of your skills by doubling the proficiency modifier so let's go back to level 3 I was a bit too soon there level 3 you always have 15 with expertise you always roll at least a 17 which is enough to succeed in those high medium skills uh, skill rolls that you might need to do without actually rolling or expending any type of resource once you gain level 4 you make it 18 by pumping your charisma once you go to level 5 your proficiency goes up to 3 times 2 thanks to expertise a level 5 eloquence bard never rolls lower than 20 on persuasion or um, deception if you would roll a nat 20 you have 30 15 would give you 25. There's two problems with this. Two solutions, and both are problematic, rather. One, your DM is screwed over because any type of social interaction is going to be dominated by you and your excruciatingly strong roles. Two, the DM has to jack up the difficulty class to compensate for your um, large and present power in these skill roles making it nigh impossible for anyone except you to succeed in these roles. And it would be bad DMing, to be honest, to make a separate skill DC for you and one for the rest. That wouldn't make sense. So this feature doesn't make you good at social interaction. It allows you to skip 90% of social interaction. You will roll so high and it's easy to make a situation where you have to roll, you know. And of course, I'm well aware that it's not because you succeed on the persuasion check that you get everything that you want. If you run up to the king and you tell him, give me all your riches and you're all at 20, he's not going to give you all your all of his riches. He's not going to get you killed. But in any meaningful campaign-based interaction where there's like a window for um, social encounters to actually gain something, the bard can, the eloquence bard can just go, don't worry, I got this. Because I all, at level 5, I'll always roll 20. Period. To illustrate my point even further, about a year ago I played Minds of Endelver. I actually hadn't played uh, Fanny uh, up to that point. Um, and the Dungeon Master was new. She was somebody who had played before, but had not DM'd before. And I was like, okay, finally I get to play a bard. I've only played bard in one shots. And I love the class, but for some reason I never got to playing it. And I absolutely adore bards. I was like, right, right, okay, we're going eloquent. And I did the math, I was like, uh-huh, level 4, 18, and all of my persuasion checks. That is going to be annoying as hell for a new dungeon master to have to deal with a character that almost cannot fail. Because you don't have the experience yet to know where to modify what. You kind of run stuff by the book at that point. And it's hard to compete with a character who can talk to anyone and get them to drop their pants, by matter of speaking. I don't play the horny bard, but... You get the idea. I ended up playing a glamour bard and I had way more fun because I actually had social interactions where I um, had a chance of failing. It makes it a lot more fun for me as well. If I know that I'm going to win almost everything, there's no point to me for playing it. So Silver Tongue is why I hate the Eloquence Bard. I love the Eloquence Bard for all of their other features. They're good, they're great. Um, the bardic inspiration related one is unsettling words so instead of inspiring someone you throw a bardic to an enemy and they have to roll it and deduct the number from their next saving throw before the start of your next turn so you can bonus action 
toss the die and then cast the spell with a saving throw and have a higher chance of landing or one of your spellcasting friends can throw a spell and have a higher chance of landing the spell. This is good, this is not broken, even though, I mean, at higher levels you're rolling a d10, d12 um, inspiration die, which is insanely strong again. I mean, oh yes, you just lost 12 on your save, I'm afraid. Well, it is going to be 7 on average, but that's still a, a lot to lose on a save knowing that you can add things like Bane to this. So this is not a broken feature, but it is for sure a very strong feature, but it takes away your role as a party buffer. So, you know, choice of choices, this works just fine. Universal speech, the lamest of all the options here is that uh, at level six, of course, uh, anyone can understand you for one hour. You can basically indicate the number of people up to the, your charisma modifier and they will understand you for one hour regardless of what language you are speaking. It's once per long rest unless you spend a cell spell slot and it is any spell slot. You can spend a level one spell slot to fuel this. There's a spell that allows you to understand languages and that's a level three spell. So here you can fuel this with level one spell slots. Yay! Um, and level 14 infectious inspiration. I actually really like this. As a reaction, when somebody uses one of your bardic uh, dice and they succeed at whatever they're doing, even if, if the dice is not relevant, the, the roll succeeds, so they attack, they add your bardic and they hit, you can, as a reaction, inspire someone else with a bardic inspiration die without spending, spending an actual bardic inspiration die. There is a limit to this. You can only do this a number of times per long rest equal to your charisma modifier. So let's say in the end you'll do this five times a day. This is really good. Your bardic's reset on a short rest already. Now you basically have a pool of five potential extra bardic's without needing to rest. This is a strong capstone feature. Bardics are flexible, but not an overpowered feature. You cannot use them for unsettling words, which would be broken, but it opens up more opportunities to use unsettling words because being able to pass inspiration along to a friend actually allows you to have the other dice for unsettling words. And I don't think anywhere in the ability text I saw that this cannot trigger of each other. So you inspire the fighter, the fighter does a great attack, you react to inspire, uh, inspire the cleric. The cleric makes an amazing save, you react, you inspire the rogue with the same expenditure of one bardic inspiration die, but of course you've used your infectious inspiration feature twice and you need two turns to do this because it uses two reactions. So it can have an incredibly powerful chain effect, but it's limited to five times a day, so that's good. That's the College of Eloquence. Power level-wise, combat-wise, uh, I think Unsettling Words is powerful. It's, it sure is powerful. Um, other spellcasters can adapt and make sure that they have at least one or two good save-based um, effects because obviously this does nothing for uh, spell attack rolls. Um, Silver Tongue is broken. Let's just name it what it is. It is a terribly broken feature. Uh, and that infectious inspiration and universal speech are strong features. They're good. The College of Eloquence is going to be amongst the most powerful bardic subclasses. If you're looking for sheer power, Eloquence is one of your top picks. Not necessarily because of the combat prowess, I mean that is kind of limited to um, unsettling words and your level 14 feature, which is way down the line. I mean not many campaigns go that far, but the impact that you're going to have on the social aspect of the game is going to be immense. It potentially breaks uh, part, parts of campaigns. So now let's move away. Oh, I mean, it's not because I don't like that that you shouldn't play. This is a fun subclass, but just talk to your dungeon master about the fact that you're going to dominate the social game heavily. Perfectly fine, it can work. We're going to move on to the College of Glamour now. So we come to a subclass then that I love quite a bit. It is the College of Glamour. I'm going to try not to be biased on this because I like the idea. Um, Lore-wise, this would mean that your bard has been taught how to bard even harder by a creature with a very strong rela relation to the Feywild. So it could be a creature from the Fey or somebody who spent a lot of time there for all I care. There is a very strong link to the Feywild. This 
actually puts into the spotlight something that people forget a lot, but bards are actually the class that studies the most after wizards, I think, because they're always looking for long lost lore, stories from beyond time. People underestimate how much knowledge a bard actually possesses. It's more than just a loot and trying to seduce the dragon. Please don't seduce the dragon. Um, so here your tutor is otherworldly and it shows in how these abilities radiate. Uh, it's one of the things actually that I really like about this subclass. There's a cosmetic aspect to it as well. I always like subclass with cosmetic aspects. We start at level 3 with Mantle of Inspiration, which is your Bardic Inspiration die feature. As a bonus action, you can spend one of those die, you don't have to roll it, but you just grant uh, a number of people equal to your Charisma modifier, 5 temporary hit points, and the ability to move as a reaction without provoking opportunity attacks, and they gain their full speed. So a very useful shuffle them around ability. Um, the temporary hit point scale at level 5, you get 8 hit points at level 10 you get 11 and at 4, 15 you get uh, 14 extra temporary hit points. This might sound a bit underwhelming, but remember you're granting this to a number of people. So even at level 3, where you only have uh, 16 charisma max, uh, with point by of course, uh, you are still granting 15 temporary hit points in total, plus 3 free movement actions, which is pretty damn good. Um, it might not be as obviously amazing but your wizard or your sorcerer is surely going to appreciate some free movement space and a bit of extra hit points uh i played a glamour bard who also had aid the spell aid in his repertoire so combining aid for extra hit points with mantle of inspiration for extra hit points actually made our party a lot buffer at lower levels and we didn't have a tank so that was very welcome um so yeah i like this this is a decent ability. The temporary hit points scale with level. They don't become crazy strong, but I mean, if your charisma is 20 and you're level 10, you can hand out 55 temporary hit points in total. That's not bad with a bonus action and uh, a die that resets on a short rest. That's actually pretty good. Mind you, you cannot grant these to yourself as per wording because the wording says you can see the creature and the creature can see you. And obviously, you can see the creature, and the creature can. Oh, no, I cannot see you. It's a bit of a confusing wording. Uh, you can see the creature, yes, but I can also see me. Nothing. Uh, it's a very confusing wording. If you want to be sure that you can cast it on yourself, bring a mirror. Oh, look, I can see me, and it can see me, and there we go. Bijabuja, I can temporary hit points myself. No, I think the wording is a bit in line with stuff like the usual bardic inspiration where you can grant bardic inspiration to other people but not to yourself uh, it's a bit of a confusing wording there's a ways around it deal with it enthralling performance then at level six very straightforward if you've been performing for over a minute you can have a number of creatures equal to your charisma modifier uh, make a wisdom saving throw if they fail the save they become charmed by you, they will idolize you, speak good about you to other people and they will hinder those that oppose you in non-violent ways unless they, will, they were already inclined towards violence to begin with. Strong in social situations, pretty useless in combat, of course, um, because a minute is 10 turns and combat is over by then. But in social situations, you as the bard performing somewhere makes sense. And then trying to subtly influence those around you, perfect stuff. Also very important to know, if they make the save, you leave no trace. Uh, there are spells that leave traces, like the Friendship Cantrip and I think Charm Person as well. They make the person aware that you were charming them once the spell is over. This one does not. So yes, you can play a song for the king and try to uh, charm him. And no, the court wizard cannot counterspell this because it is not a spell. So there's a, in social interaction, this can be a very strong ability, but it's niche. You need a minute to perform uh, combat useless. I mean, it's a niche ability, but it's a pretty cool ability. Uh, it resets, by the way, on short and long rest, so that's also pretty good. Uh, followed up by, oh, there was also level three, of course, the enthralling performance. 
Uh, and then at level 6 you have Mantle of Majesty. Um, I really like this ability. You activate it by casting Command as a bonus action. You don't have to know this spell. You can now cast Command as a bonus action. There you go. Um, and by doing so, you also start to look more awesome and exotic and fey like and this this is I, I you obviously all know I do these role playing guides. This is a really cool subclass to imagine a visual aspect for. What do you look like? What do your spells look like? I had a lot of fun with that. Um, so you cast command as a bonus action, you start to look damn awesome. And for the coming minute or until they break your concentration, which leads me to believe that this ability requires concentration. The wording is a bit vague, but let's assume it does. You can cast command as a bonus action each turn. For those of you that don't know command, command is like the basic mind control spell where you can give a one word order to someone, something, and they will do that order if they fail the save. Uh, stuff like flee, stop, halt, cease, uh, run, those those are all okay so you can if, if people fail to say if you can make them waste a turn by saying uh halt and they will not do anything halt is literally worded in the book as they will cease to take any action so and flee will obviously make them run away as if they were frightened it's a level one spell you cast it as a bonus action where it's normally a zac an action though and it doesn't cost you any spell slots ever no this is the best part the command is free to cast you do not need spell slots so that's hypothetical 10 castings of command without having to spend the spell slot as a bonus action it's pretty good and to make it all better if for some reason you manage to get your uh, enthralling performance going so people are charmed by you uh, they automatically fail this save and it doesn't have to be charmed by enthralled performance if for any reason any creature is already charmed by you they will fail this command save um it might not surprise you that this is a once per long rest ability because this can be i think this has the potential to be a combat changer the fact that you can um cease well you can block specific creatures every turn again and again if they fail the save of course um, has a lot of potential. It's a good ability. And then we have Unbreakable Majesty at level 14. You permanently look more lovely and fierce, as the book puts it, which sounds like a nice combination. Um, and as a bonus action, you can turn on Majestic Presence, so to speak, for a full minute. Uh, and it's it's really good. I mean, it's a high-level ability. It's not going to see play a lot of the time, but I, it's a really strong ability. Um, while you're in this majestic presence and a creature tries to attack you, they first have to take a, wisdom, a charisma save in this case. If they fail the save, they cannot attack you this turn. Uh, you have to trigger it, by the way. Well, it triggers automatically, of course. When a creature attacks you the first time in a turn, they have to roll a charisma save. They fail the save, they cannot attack you. If there is another valid target within range, they have to redirect their attack. Otherwise, the attack is wasted. If the creature succeeds, they get to attack you, but they have disadvantage on all saves versus your spells until the start of an next turn or whatever. Yeah, I forgot to write that down, but they have disadvantage against all of your spells for a bit. Um, pretty good. Um, I like this. Even, even if they make the save, they get pretty screwed over. I mean, having this advantage on saving throw at this level can be potentially um, deadly. Um, you have literally, by now, you have any spell in the game. I mean, you're a bard, you've had magical secrets, you can pick whatever, and you know somebody has a really high chance of fumbling that save. Have fun, go to town. It's a high level ability. It's a really powerful high level ability. Um, it resets also on a short rest, not just long rest. This is short rest, long rest. So if having your bardics and your enthralling performance reset was not initiate, like in, um, incentive enough to make you take a short rest now and then, this should be. The fact that you could do this twice a day, for example, is really strong. Um, I think the Glamour College is pretty strong. There are some niche abilities. The enthralling performance is niche, of course. 
and the free movement of mantle of inspiration is not always going to be relevant but the abilities are at the very least good and in the right situation very potent I don't think it's as, it's as strong as College of Eloquence, but I'm glad it's not as... I mean, I've already said Eloquence is broken, so I'm happy that this is not as strong as College of Eloquence. I do think this is a damn strong um, college, especially for having an influence on social situation, thanks to enthralling performance, thanks to the level 6 ability Mantle of Majesty. You can influence a lot of people, you can command them. There, there's synergy between the abilities, which I like. You get good abilities at level 3 and a few good ones afterwards. It's a very solid Bard class. Um, yeah, that's it. It's, it's, that's all what I wanted to do today. So, we had 108 subclasses to discuss and after today we have 105 left to discuss. I can see the progress already. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, I encourage you to share your experiences about playing what I talked about. So if you have anything to say about these subclasses, let me know in the comments down below. And if all goes well, I will see you all again in two weeks in the Attic Dungeon.